we're actually stuck, all of us at home these days, talking and chatting and quite often talking to more people than we, we, we used to beforehand because we wouldn't get to see as many of the people as we do now. I, I don't know how many people I've seen more recently over the last few weeks, but I, I see a lot more than I would have done when life was classed as normal. In the room, 52 Jokers Wild. Why build a robot? That was where we thought of the future would be. Build a robot body and download yourself into that. The tech in the last 30 to 50 years has said, feck that, we'll build an organic version and we can fast grow it in a 3D yeah. test tube equivalent. And now all we got to do is put the spark of life in. We can, all the bits are in the right order. Now all that's missing is the soul and all the soul actually is is ones and zeros that has a volume of gigabytes or terabytes, and that's you. Plug in and play. There, here we go. So well, there's there's the Westworld. Do you remember Westworld? Plug and play. You've got Westworld, which is a Ubrina one, which is a slightly different one where they made sort of actual robots who look like humans. But the newer version of Westworld that was on HBO, basically they did actually 3D print them and actually create a bit like the the Ghost in the Machine also, which is a Japanese kind of version of that whole sort of thing. It's the same kind well, of concept. I think exactly. If you start thinking of the organic version that we've had, if we can. Build a 3D version, organic version, which we can. We can grow ears and on the backs of rats and we can do all sorts and test tubes. We can 3D print, you know, various organs. And by definition, you can 3D print the bones. But you're starting to go, but bones break. Are we going to do them in titanium? Why, why would you not go to the next level of the new super improved $6 million man? $6 million man back in 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. I, it's probably 2.4 billion now. I'm not too sure what the pricing conversion would be. But if you were redoing the $6 million man with inflation and CPI, is that now $6 billion man? But if it is and we can mass produce, we're back to the same thing. Would you be building a little bit of more flexibility into those bones. You can organically wrap the organic around it. You can have the brain in there and it may be an AI brain, but as long as it's you in ones and zeros and personality, you don't know any better. It's you. It's just you have a longer sell by date. So, you know, that's what the new, we want to have the new improved you. We'd like to be able to afford the $6 billion man, woman, or anywhere in between, as long as we can afford to build it. You know, now it's all about, do you have a big enough cloud package so you can actually store yourself in order to be able to upload and download you. Well, in uh, there's a Bruce Willis movie called The Surrogate. And in that, all the human beings that can afford it, basically they have a surrogate version of them, which is a robot. And they basically sit at home, you know, in their enclosed environments, whatever's happened to them. And they basically plug themselves in a bit like uh, Ready Player One. But this time they actually go into a physical body that runs around the real world. It's, but it's still a kind of virtual world for them because they're still, they're still having to disconnect from themselves and go into this other one to experience the real world. And, and again, it's, you, you come back to the sense that if it's going to cost six billion to have the effectively a real life avatar that is mechanical running around and having all the problems, why not create a, a virtual digital one that would allow you to fly? even like Superman, which is what's in the, the Ready Player One type thing, and most of the games that people are getting into. I mean, if you start looking at what the VR stuff's now getting to, it will... One of the things they did, they did a test uh, quite a few years ago where they had a monkey in, in uh, and they had a mechanical arm, and the monkey was connected up through its brain, and it was moving its arm around, and it could see the mechanical arm move. And then it got tired, and it dropped its arm down, but it still was moving the arm, and he went... Well, hang on a second. I don't need to move this bit. I could just move that bit and forget about that bit. So once you get to the point where your brain can actually move other things and you don't have to physically move this, then you kind of go, right, you don't need, do you need this body? That's the key thing. Do you need this body? Because if, if you can just be part of an uploaded thing that uh, can go wherever you want to on any kind of journey, a bit like what the Westworld's concept was, but they didn't realize what they could do with the virtual world. You know, you don't need the real world. You can just be in this fantasy world. But that causes problems itself, doesn't it? <laughs> well, we're already halfway there with uh, the son and his mates and the, all these EA gamers. You know, they're in the room. Right? We're in the room. Like, this is, we, we are in the room. That's our show. You know, the, actually, I think I'm going to show you. 
we are the elephant, elephant in, in the, room. the room is what we're addressing at the best of times and the elephant in the room my, my son is only a baby elephant he's in the room at the moment and he's playing e- I, I, I keep on saying EA Sports it's some sort of God of War Lord of something Thunder I don't, I don't know what but it involves running around shooting people and shouting at the mates to go off and do stuff and we chat about this before but it's back to as you said they're living lives across the planet with wings they can to fart and travel through space it, it's a, this virtual space but when you're in this immersion space you're going you know he probably has more flight towers on than most pilots out there because the only physical difference is you've got the same keyboard in front of you you've got the same control panel you've got the ai telling you you're taking off from new york and landing in dublin you cannot tell the difference the chair shakes and the control shakes you're, and that's where actually I think another show I only watched the other day uh, it's probably on Netflix or, or Beyond the Wire what you have here yes. is, is drone pilots you can kill from a distance but when you get into the war you suddenly realise this is real people this is real things but I was I was playing a game to five minutes ago but well, what's on the ground is a, a, a real life effect but if I think it's a game it is a game that is many a film out there from Ready Player One to Ender's Game and God knows what your being your, your your empathy is taking away because it's characters on a screen and that's what they're doing in war games but i mean at the same time you know with the pandemic out there and if we start going we can put a body out there that can go to a different planet we can if we have a line of sight we can probably have our avatar counterpart on a different planet while we are here but we could be plugged in to effectively a test tube some bubbles on food and our, our awareness is in the machine and it goes becomes the ghost in the machine at a distance. You're going, what constitutes you? What constitutes awareness? What is real and what is not? If our mind believes that it is, we don't even know if we're real or are we the sort of the ghost in the machine? Are we the game? player or the avatar from someone else's ready player one we don't know because the program has been told not to tell us and i think what's happening at the moment is that we're now the the initial worries that you might have had about starting a new business or starting a new venture i think or feel that they are starting to sort of move away a little bit because i'm i personally now feel that there's like doors opening that weren't there before the the I think because we've, we're we're creating something solid, the opposition to what we're doing is no longer it's fumbling. You know, I know in the conversations that we've had in the past, um, people will come and they criticise what you're saying, and then not your and maybe it's just the uh, the insecurity that I might have had in the past uh, would have meant I would have maybe crumbled. But now I'm finding, hang on, no, there's a certain resilience there that we've now got, and instead of getting that negativity from other people, we're getting a certain sense of positivity. Which is, which is actually fueling us even more and keeping that engine going. So the sense of harmony I was talking about is that we're, we're in a flow that we feel that we can continue going and the motivation now is, is allowing us to take the next step and the next step. In fact, you know that harmony that I'm now finding is allowing me to, to run the extra mile, to, you know, to keep on going, to keep that stamina going. You know, the, the resilience is there that is making me feel happy about what I'm doing. And I'm feeling more and more contented uh, that, that, you know, there's a process going on that, or rather, again, it's back to that sense of value. That, that, that thing that brings harmony, that gives me a sense of now I can carry on, uh, which because you can start on certain types of journeys. And if you get the negativity coming, you, you kind of give, well, what's the point? I give up. I don't feel valued. As I feel more valued now, it's now giving me that energy level, that that substance that you need to keep on going, the fuel, in fact, to keep the engine going. And that's, that was a word that we've, we've used quite a few times is the engine. You know, the fuel is now coming in and those, those, ref, those responses that we're getting from other people is now fueling my enthusiasm. It's now in fueling, fueling my stamina, keeping me going. I now know that I can keep up that pace and I'm now energized to do the next step, the next step, because it's usually it's looking at the small steps. There's a massive amount of material that we have to actually cover to get through to where we want to go. We know it's going to take a long time. We also know we don't know everything, but we're getting there. We, we, we have the confidence. We know how this thing fits together. It's a puzzle. We've just got to make sure we put the right pieces in the right place in the puzzle and then it will come together. 
but it takes time and we have to have patience. And I think from some of the things that I've been looking at on YouTube about, you know, uh, business and about uh, being able to keep on going is that most people will give up after the first two to three years because they haven't seen the results, but they haven't maybe concreted that vision of what it is they're trying to actually achieve. And I think we have. We set our, we knew what the end goal was. We knew what we're trying to do. When we get deflected from it, because we know that that's a fairly solid thing that we're trying to get to, we've experienced it in, in different forms, in different areas. We, and we, know, we, we, we talked about that future, future memories. We, we, we're actually living it. I'm living it in my mind. I'm seeing things that are reminding me of where we're actually going. We're able now to talk to other people who, who are stakeholders in the industry and actually allow them to see how our vision matches into their vision. And they now become energized by what we're actually giving them. We're not trying to take something away from them. In fact, the more that we can collaborate as a team, as a group of people who have similar aspirations, the stronger each of our projects will actually become because they can interact with one another. And I think that's something that on my journey, I've noticed that hadn't happened in the past. Everybody was wanting to keep their own little piece. They didn't want to share it with everybody. And that's why they ended up having to do multiple jobs, multiple tasks, just to keep their own project going. But in reality, you can't achieve that. You've got to work with other people. It's the collaboration and it's it's the, the, the sharing the ideas, not be frightened of the ideas and being able to keep that thing going. Because once we've made our first film, I don't want to just stop there. You know, and, and I say our film, it, it's, it's a collaborative team film. There are other people who have aspirations of what they want to achieve on that. And we can give them that, that opportunity that, that maybe we never had when we were younger. And this is where we can bring something back into the industry and make sure that it, it becomes a successful thing. We will become that industry. It will become industrious. It will be an engine, you know, hopefully a green engine, <laughs> keep the green screens going, but it will actually be an engine that will help you know, preserve work for people, preserve uh, opportunities for people. And, and, and also uh, in the long term, the, the stakeholder at the very end is the person that will watch our film because of the style and quality of what we'll be able to produce. More and more people will eventually get to hear about it. More and more people want to watch it. Those individuals that you've got technology that tries to place the ad in front of you. That's listening to you. The platforms are there, the Facebooks of the world, all of the different platforms, they make their money from the advertising, from the product placement. That's what the money machine is. They've got the TV stations in your hand. They've got you hooked. They've got you addicted. They've, they know where you are 24 seven. They're listening and they're proffering what it is they think you're interested in based on previous actions. And as I said, as a consumer, I'm sick to death of it. But as a business person, I've got to learn the tricks of the trade and figure out how the hell are we going to get heard, seen in this clutter of madness so we can actually deliver the information to those that do actually want it, but they themselves are fighting it and are afraid to look at this machine for fear of 50 other adverts out in there as well. So there's a social media, I don't need to worry. Well, we're gonna go on TikTok soon, possibly Instagram, maybe a bit of Pinterest. I don't even, we, I can barely say the words in a sentence, never mind understand what the, what, what the hashtags need to be in order to do the right search engine optimization in order to be, actually, that's if you have content. You gotta generate this content, slice and dice it up the yin yang, put it up, you know, make it attractive, make it, you know, that it's very, very functional and then figure out how to hell to target it. So, and this is all in your spare time while actually trying to run a business. So everyone's, every small business out there has this set of problems. They have to pay for these experts. They have to generate that content. None of this is actually from 98% of them, their business. It is as the have to do, must do, need to do, just to get seen to possibly sell a product. But this is the way forward. It's powerful if you can, if you can actually work the algorithm, if you can, befriend the ghost in the machine, then you can be a multi-millionaire overnight. But if you can't, you're just all out there doing the same old, same old, and you're drowning in in, in data, but with no, no intelligence, you know. So back to you. The great thing is that you, 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 that the concept of the way that the advertising is pumped before you as you, as you move into the, 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 the aisles of wherever you're going reminded me of 
the film, which is Minority Report. That's a Tom Cruise film I was trying to think about, which is also another Philip K. Dick story. But in that, he was walking around and basically everywhere he went, you know, he was being advertised to. Well, as as we were having lunch, I was watching a, a video on YouTube and it was talking about what is supposed to be coming out in the next year, the the uh, Apple glasses. So I've got my glasses on here. I was, I was going to pretend I had some glasses, but I've actually got them here. And, and when they're in that place, in that, in that position on my nose there, basically all the adverts would just be popping up in front of you, kind of going, oh, it would be the minority report. You wouldn't be able to escape because all your social media would be popping up. You'd be getting all these interruptions and things like that. And depending on where you looked at, you'd probably put your hand in front and touch there'd be a kind of perspective that you could actually touch these things and they'd start doing things and it'll all be inside your glasses. It's turning into a mad, mad world. I wonder what Philip K. Dick and uh, uh, and George Orwell would think about if they were living today. There's a great story. That's what we should do for our movie. We should actually resurrect George Orwell and Philip K. Dick, an American and an English guy who suddenly find themselves in the 21st century trying to deal with all the things that they actually talked about and and kind of what would they do and how how would they turn their ideas into science fiction to make a movie that's who the characters could be philip k dick and george orwell stuck in the 21st century trying to make a feature film that isn't science fiction <laughs> my little theory that i'm just about to sort of develop as we talk and because of what we've been the conversation we've been having i believe that there's god on one side and there's the universe on this side and they're actually they have uh uh, an accordion between the two of them and they're actually pulling it so time keeps sort of stretching out and then it keeps getting compressed in and then it gets stretched out and they're making these kind of weird noises kind of thing backwards and forwards <laughs> and you end up with this tune that's coming along and we're actually the tune we're actually the music that is actually left afterwards called human beings and well the imagery <laughs> that gave me is stephen Hawkins' brief history of time and what it is, is is the universe, he, I think he postulated when he was in his college days that the, the universe is still expanding. And we don't know how, you know, it's, he, he, I think it was a mention of an elastic band. It's like saying, at what point are we on that expansion of pulling that elastic band all the way out? Now, again, where the center of the universe is doesn't really matter for the moment. There was a big bang. And it's going out in all directions. It's going out from that point of origin and it's expanding. And later on, when the tech allowed further into his career, they were able to measure the speed of light from diff diff distant stars and planets that showed the measure had actually got longer and further away from, from earlier, measure, er, earlier measure points, which then showed that that had moved away. At X speed, therefore, it was still expanding, and it proved as null hypothesis became, you know, proven uh, hypothesis because the tech arrived to prove the point. And was, he had other, you know, certain theories about so stuff not being able to, ex nothing can escape the pull of a black hole. But he since I think before he died, I think he said no. No, there are things that can escape this this event horizon and all that, or come out of the black hole. But earlier on. He, that was the hypothesis and the null hypothesis because no, no one could even find a black hole. No one could disprove it because he couldn't even measure it. This was all ideology based on assumption and pre preposition and, and everything else. But then the tech arrived and they could. But you just said the accordion and, and, and it's been stretched out. That's the elastic band. That's the universe. So it's not the universe fighting God. The universe is the actual accordion in the middle. So there's this other unknown. And it's actually God doing God, that then. And they're pulling it. <laughs> and they're, this is the universe is expanding and contracting over time. So when it expands to the full of the elastic band, what happens next is it's the elastic Couldn't band track. starts to pull back. Yeah. And they are saying this will happen. Now, how many billion, million years it's going to take to do that? It doesn't matter. But what's going to happen at the end, restaurant at the end of the universe is it all comes back and starts contracting and suns and the black hole swallows suns and suns implode into white dwarfs and all the above happen. And ah. we'll, you know, six billion years from now, is the is the end of our universe uh, our universe as we know it but there's multiple million universes out there but that expand if we follow that hypothesis the elastic band universe will at some point start to contract we don't need to worry about it some generational you know you know ancestor well, not i can never get this right not our ancestor but our but yeah. our further generations of, of our children's children's there children 
will have that problem if we're lucky. But again, if you go from <laughs> 1 billion to 10 billion to 20 billion in a couple of hundred years, this, this planet, in the absence of something we don't know now, is going to be well past the tipping point and effectively it cannot sustain the, even the amount of air being bred in and out there in terms of carbon monoxide unless we figure out how to store it. And if the ice caps are melting and that's been released from the past, we're not going to have the problem of worrying about that and neither will our future generations because the tipping we have to come up with new tech to store carbon monoxide, shoot it into space, and able to sustain generating food for these mass populations. Well, I think what what because what, what you've actually just now been discussing there is we, we went back to the idea of frequency. So, so once once it goes out, it has to come back. You you can't you can't have an up without a down. You have the up and down frequency. And we've been talking about the expanse. So the problem was I think the likes of Stephen Hawkins and all that, they didn't have a measurement to measure the biggest distance because they weren't around long enough to actually get the big. So the frequency was only on part of it. One of the other concepts that you suddenly started to talk about there, which kind of reminded me of the film Tenant that's just been out recently, was the fact that actually if it's going back, there is somewhere in this universe or an alternative universe where we are actually talking about what we're doing now and as opposed to watching our waveforms going one way and being created, it's being unraveled the other way. And we're actually doing the Benjamin Button stint of going backwards from dying, being born, you know, dying and becoming something, and then actually being born, but the other way around, and actually doing everything in reverse. And they're sitting there kind of going, God, flipping heck, look what they have to do. They have to be born and go through and die <laughs> to come back. I no, you're actually right you're actually there was an episode of Red Dwarf, yeah, and I think I think it was called Backwards. It may have, it may not have been. They, they <laughs> arrived on whatever planet, and I said Nod Nod Nol or something, which was London, I think it yeah. was. And th that's exactly that was what was happening. They were moving forward in a backwards time flowing world. Now it was very funny. I enjoyed that show now because it was they were, oh, you know, opened their mouth and a, and a, and a creamy Claire would come out That's of it, it and they'd put it back on the table <laughs> and take money and, and the girl would pay them for the, their own money back. Yep. But I mean, as you said, it's if when they, when they want to do what the bear does in the woods, you know, it was going the opposite direction. You don't want to be doing that. But at the same time, you're going, Small minor detail. I don't believe in that concept of time traveling backwards and people being, you know, dying and then then working back to being like a fetus no it doesn't make sense for it doesn't make sense to me ah, I, 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 but the alternative I, you the alternative you does he can't make sense of what we're doing each of the old ancient stories including the one as his name siri or circa or whatever his name was talking about the uh the 13th planet that was supposed to whiz through and every 3,600 years or so, it's the ellipse comes in and they can actually travel to us. And that's apparently where the Sumerians had come from. And there's all these ideas that apparently the DNA was changed and hacked and put into us from uh, a certain period of time, which is where Adam and Eve came from. And I think we already had a story about that where we were going back a few weeks ago on, on the fact that about 10,000 years or so many thousand years ago, there were just two people on the planet. And we kind of discussed the idea that the Neanderthals were still around at that point, but we wiped them out shortly afterwards when there was four people. But the interesting thing is that, that this kind of story is quite interesting because we do kind of worship the tech because you think about it, me and Garvin are actually separated by quite a distance. We've said this quite a few times. We have all this tech around us that allows us fairly quickly within a fraction of a second to communicate to one another. There's no lag or latency as they call it. And the thing is that we're, we're, we're actually stuck, all of us at home these days, talking and chatting and quite often talking to more people than we, we, we used to beforehand because we wouldn't get to see as many of the people as we do now. I, I don't know how many people I've seen more recently over the last few weeks, but I, I see a lot more than I would have done when life was classed as normal. So we are in this kind of, <clears throat> it reminds me of lots of sci-fi. I remember reading an Ian e. Foster uh, book. He was a guy that wrote uh, A Room with a View. Uh, but this one was called The Machine Stops. And I think we've discussed that before in this show where basically they forgot how to do things. They forgot how to figure things out because the technology did it all themselves. We're entering this era of time where artificial intelligence is coming. We talked about a few weeks ago the chip that they were putting into cockroaches that were, they could control where they went. 
And we've seen those ideas in, in sci-fi movies over the years, which is quite good fun. And that just shows how much the sci-fi inspires. But one of the problems that we were having, I, I know that somebody commented on one of our uh, little Android video things that we put out on LinkedIn recently, and they were saying how frightening it is that we are allowing automation to take over our lives. And we're no longer thinking. We, you know, The idea was that these things would be put there to take the drudgery out of life. But what if the drudgery was there so that you actually had time to think about things? Because you couldn't think about what you were doing. It was so automated. But you had time to think and ponder and come up with all these amazing ideas for, for stories that you could tell somebody else. That becomes great. Now we're so busy telling stories to other people, we don't have time to write those stories down because it's not automated. So there is that kind of conflict about how much should we be overly efficient to how much do we need to have time to figure things out and solve problems because we don't really want to spoon feed ourselves at the same time and and lose there's a great movie what is it um I think it is it the movie with the little yellow android type thing what was it called where he he falls in love with another one and it turns out all the people on the spaceship are basically being pampered to and they're 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 obese they've never controlled their lives they're just being feed fed and fed tech and fed ideas to to buy them but they never do any exercises and it's uh, it's this little android's job to I keep don't know them if you're mixing up two movies function. there it might be Wally and could be something else yeah it i think it's two. Wally I think it's Wally. That was the one. I just couldn't get the name, Wally. But I think it was Wally. His, his job was to make sure that the whole place was actually working. But if you, in that sense, the, 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 really the moral of that story is don't, let, don't get so et, caught up in the technology that it, it, it does everything for you because in the end, you'll be a slave to it, not the other way around. And I think that's where the, where, where the concerns are that we're actually getting into. So there's a lot of rambling going on about sort of um, – <laughs> worshipping tech, wherein, in fact, it's the agent that uh, controls the tech that we have to be worried about. Now, you touched on two... Well, I'm not going to say touched on two things because I can't remember one of, them, one of them. So you touched on something. And, <laughs> you know, all, I, because my, my Alzheimer's or my memory is... My goldfish memory span is... I, I was trying to remember, but he kept on talking. And by the time he finished, I forgot half of it. So I'm coming back in to go. What, what I what I what I remember in the last minute, a couple of minutes, was this um, the humdrum. It's it's the fact that you know we the tech is meant to take away the, the humdrum, but if it did, you might be left with nothing. But and I said that that void we're saying is meant to be for our creativity. But if you're not a creative individual, what the void has just done is left you with this hole that if you're not motivated to fill, you'd start worrying. You'd let the darkness in. You'd stress. You'd have no purpose. And this humdrum for some was purpose, whereas humdrum to others was a nuisance. It was in the way. It was taken from the value. So not everybody, that's where it comes back to our, our own lives. Not, not everybody is the same. It doesn't work equally. We don't have the same aspirations. A lot of people are happy just going having a simple job, a simple purpose, earn enough, and then they value the time that's left over with their family, their friends, and going out, because time is filled. Whereas if their time was empty, that, that, that's where this darkness comes from. Not a lot of people, maybe now, they're, they're, even though they re retain their title of CEO or head of industry, there are, there's articles out there even today, I think, that says they're at home. No one can see them. No one can recognize that they're the god of industry and they're the captain of the ship and they're, they're at home in the bedroom typing on a type... Well, not a, I, I use the language of a typewriter. It's still a typewriter. I don't care if you call it an iPad or wherever it is. You've got, you've got to do the letters. You've got to create it. You're, you've got this block between you and humanity. Your machine and tech is this, is this funnel to the other side if you're typing or if you're even talking and you're in your Zoom teams calls that it's you're now nearly an equal size square on 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 the screen and your voice is near, is, is a certain tone and presence and if it's if it's 200 heads on the screen who's the boss and who cares because most of them could be turned off and you don't they're not even watching they're in their pajamas but i mean but there, there's a distance what's happened is there's now a distance from the worker to the boss and uh, the work and, and it's that you're you can't see the suit you're not walking by and everyone's in awe of, of the of the c-suite executives doing the strut of power 
front to the boardroom and back again. So there is a, you miss that. That's what people say. They miss being seen. They miss being heard. They miss wearing the suit. They miss the journey from A to B that sets the pace of the day and divides the home life from the work life. If we do, all we're doing is walking from one room to the next room, I and mean, we're lucky if we were to put our trousers on. So it, it's 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 how you fill your day, but sometimes it's how others see you fill your day might also be the value. How often do we need to repeat stories? That's that's the other key thing. How often do we need to repeat stories? He repeated himself again and again and again. We need to cut those things out. We need to look at how can we concisely and creatively compose the words that we're actually saying so they have meaning, but allow other people to actually speak as well. And I think in a lot of conversations that I've been having recently, what I've actually found, and there's another actually to cut out as I suddenly thought about it, what I've been finding is that if you listen to what's going on, you can condense your words down to you know, two or three sentences that may only be about 15 words. And you've said it so succinctly that everybody else suddenly goes, oh my God, that was very profound. That was very deep. It doesn't mean to be that way, but you've said it so concisely that there's nothing else that needs to be said at that point. You've actually quietened your audience down. So there may be a little technique to work in there as well. Maybe not with Garvin. Let's see what Garvin has to say. How concise will he be in the next section? I no, <laughs> right now. Let me back in. Oh, let me the back chains in. Chains have been broken. The problem is have been you, broken. Uh, away. There's the problem. The problem here is you were so concise, you removed the personality. Ooh. You removed the it. fluff. You removed the humanity. You were left with fact. And that was all. They asked no, just a question. Bones with no marrow. Oh, shut up. Therefore, no. So I think there's your open ended and closed ended questionnaires. Are you, and most of the time, if you have a closed ended questionnaire, you get a bunch of yes, no's, and you learn nothing, and you drove the answer to a result that was actually. Feck yeah. all use here, because it was a 50-50 between a yes and a no, or a checklist of something. And they, the question you should have been asking was, would you have picked yes or no at all? Would you have picked from the five points in question, or have you got a sixth we didn't know about? We need the open-ended questions. I don't want to be scripted. I want to be improv. In the improv, I will address the scripted. We will get the point across, but it's back to the same thing again. It was dressed up in, in its dancing clothes. It was entertaining. It was You didn't know you learned. Yeah. That's what we want out of our film academy. We want you to be the joker, not the clown. We want you to be in enjoying it because the joker in the good old times was that he was a king's ear the life he of the was a real power behind the throne the influencer that he knew all had everyone's ear he was omnipresent because everybody spoke freely in front of the fool no but the fool knew all and could direct all and basically you want to be the entertainer you want to be invited to the dance you don't want to be mr factual you do or mrs factual it's very short answer straight to the point garvin yeah not me <laughs> no one i know not gonna happen no no time soon so mr concise he's out the door mr entertainer he's in the room is it fact is it fiction is it fantasy you make your mind up after the fact but i'm not gonna well concise enough that we don't drown you and kill you but apart from that you, 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 that's what a book is about. The floweriness in there wasn't the facts. It wasn't it was raining outside. It was the floweriness was, it was a leaf. It was a green leaf. It was a green leaf in the forest. It's, you're, you're now, so you could have just said it was a leaf. That was enough. But now how, that's our problem next week. Actually, I'm going to keep it for a second because we have a pitch. But now we, we got to get down to three minutes. And we're saying we could talk for two, two hours straight and not take a breath. And every last piece of it will be factual. But now it's what, it's not that it's not, none of it's not, uh, not relevant. It's, we got to be thinking in reverse. We suddenly realize all they're really interested in is show me the money. It's not that it's concise. It's targeted and meaningful and value. But uh, the rest of it is dressing it up and dancing a dance based on a set of rules of a of maybe a, a, an investor pitch deck. None of it matters. That's to get you comfortable into the zone of why you, why my money, how much money, when do I get it back, can I have some more? We all know the real questions underneath of it. The dance and the entertainment 
is it still has to be believed. It still has to be bought. The story has to be entertaining. It has to be believable. And they want to buy it by the end. That's the fact. And we've got to be concise in the time. But we have to get every image and journey into that moment so they go on that believable journey of a future they want to buy in. So back to you. Well, one of the things I was thinking about as you we were talking there and, and when I'd finished up was the court cases. One of the biggest problems with the court cases, they want you to say yes or no. And the difficulty with the yes and no is because you said it's a closed question, you don't get any flavor of what's going on. And quite often the yes or no is misgiving, misguiding the jury. And they can accuse people, especially in the days of the death penalty. I remember the old black and white uh, f films I used to watch on the BBC when um, in the good old 60s that were really up cops and robbers and it was all in the court case. Was this the fact or not? Yes, yes, but, 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 okay. Yes is the answer. It's, he's done. Go and hang him. Got rid of him. And he went, ah, but this story tells something totally different that would have actually proved his innocent. If you'd allowed me to tell the story and get into a few of the other bits and pieces, it's not just a yes and no. And I think that, as you said before, the multiple choices that were often being asked to fill in, especially on psychological tests and things like that, you're sitting there kind of go, but that's not what I want to say. And that's not what I want to say. It's somewhere in the middle or somewhere, you know, scribbled all over the place. It's a squibbly low sort of line. And we need to add more information in there to, to give the colouring, to give the flavouring. Otherwise, it just becomes bland. So being too concise can can also cut out. I, you, you were saying cuts out the fat and down to the lean meat. I think it just goes down to the bone and the marrow has been taken out and there's nothing really left to actually eat. You know, you've got nothing to enjoy and savour. You just break your own teeth, which is no good if you're too concise. So I think that's the whole thing, isn't it? It's not being, we don't have to be too concise. We need to be able to get it out there. And I think that's one of the problems with a lot of writers is they don't quite know how to start. And sometimes it's just a case of, as we said once before, take the first step. It's a molehill. Just write and scribble and get things out and see what happens because then you can edit. There's two processes. And I think those processes are write, write first, and then edit afterwards because you can always bring it down to some kind of shape that becomes more entertaining. But also make sure you don't cut out all the good bits and just leave the dross because that can also happen as well. We've talked about throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Well, the whole reason for throwing out the bathwater was because you've cleaned the baby. But if the baby's gone as well, there's no point. <laughs> it's, it all gets a bit daft in the end. So we, there's a thing about being concise. Because I know in the classroom, because we talk, I, you know, my background having a little bit of it, uh, teaching as well. If there's no discussion in the classroom, then nobody actually enjoys it. They get bored very quickly because they're just doing things just for the sake of doing things. But they need the story behind it to give them some sense of purpose. And I think that's what we need to make sure that we do. Tell a story, a good story. Talk about the conflicts and the problems that the person's having. I was watching a, a YouTube video uh, yesterday about a scriptwriter, and they're now saying because most people get distracted so quickly that they can't, you have to get to the point of the story within about 11 minutes of a feature film. And if you haven't done that, it's going to be a long, drawn out process, and people get bored because they get distracted all the time by different things going on. And it's, it's forcing people to reveal more about what the story is actually about sooner and sooner because people have lost their patience because they want things very concise. You know, we're lucky that in the middle of this, we've switched off most of our notifications. So we're not getting a ding to say there's something on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn that we should be looking at. And hang on a second, you know, by the time you've actually gone to look at it, you, you've got three minutes that you're being told that that story is. And within about 10 seconds, it's whizzed onto something else. And now you can't find that story because it's gone because, you know, there's the conflict that we're actually having. But you need all that time to tell the story. You couldn't do it in 10 seconds or three seconds or one second because our mind needs more than that to actually process the information. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications.